Reading with your kids. Hola, Nihao, Kunichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Moni Muliwanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted that you're joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show in the iHeartRadio app on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, wherever you find your podcasts. We have three wonderful guests today. First, Antonio Sacre will be here to talk to us about the power of family stories. And later on, a father and son duo, Moro and Mateo Moro, will tell us about their Fingerman comic series. Before we invite our guests into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by the Magic of Me series by Becky Cummings. All kids deserve to be healthy and happy, but sadly, many are not. That is why it is essential to give children tools to build confidence and self-love. Finally, there's a series of children's books designed to teach our kids to create their own health and happiness. The Magic of Me is a best-selling children's series for positive growth mindset that inspires children to love themselves, love others, and to make the world a better place. From the power of their words to the foods that they eat, each book has a unique focus designed to empower kids. It's the Magic of Me series by Becky Cummings. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by the Dance It Out Creative Movement Story Series. If you know a child age four to seven, check out Dance It Out. And these beautiful illustrated tales, a real life ballerina encourages kids to act and dance along. They'll find joyful jumping jubilance alongside Joey and the Juniper and Joey finds his jump. They'll discover balance and dance alongside the cat with the crooked tail. They'll join in the rescue of Prince Naomi Helps a Unicorn. This wonderful series has 12 books, each designed by an award-winning dance instructor and featuring ballerina Kenora. Give your child the gift of joy, imagination, breath, and movement this holiday season. It's the Dance It Out Creative Movement Stories by Once Upon a Dance. Joining us right now from Los Angeles in California. You hear the laugh in my voice. This is going to be a fun one, my friends. Our guest is returning to the show. He's the greatest storyteller you've never heard of. Please welcome back Antonio Sacre. Hey, buddy, how are you? I'm good, Jedley. How are you? It's so good to be back here. It is wonderful to see you, a fellow uh, a fellow storyteller. You and I make our living going out and being live in front of audiences. And Well, at least we did before this <laughs> pandemic showed up. But um, we've been doing this for a long time. It's such a joy. It is such a joy. I'm, you know, I'm just starting to get back in front of some of the schools and, you know, uh, well, actually the thing I'm dealing with now is performing through a mask. Oh, so yes. now it's my, my big eye, you know, big eye movements and super exaggerated. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. I had to learn how to perform on zoom, which in, in many ways, uh, was pretty amazing because I got to be in places I would never go. I was in a preschool in Nigeria. I was, uh, in a college class in Singapore and, you know, all of these things were, you know, not what I would usually make, but I would, they would never fly me to Singapore right. or, or Nigeria. So, you know, the, the silver lining in Spanish, we say, uh, no hay mal que por bien no venga. There's nothing bad that something good doesn't come out of it. So, yeah, it's been, it's been challenging like all of us and also interesting. Yes, yes, yes. That, that whole, my first Zoom experience, I have this magic trick, Antonio, that it's, it always gets this huge pop. It's like something just appears right Boom. I asked a kid to grab and think about something and throw it up in the air. And then, it, boom, it, it appears out of nowhere. And it always, they get, oh, well, I did it on a Zoom and the thing appeared and I was looking at all these different screens and no one reacted at all. And I'm sitting and I'm waiting for three seconds and it felt like three years. It was the longest three seconds in my life. And then all of a sudden, all of the screens went, oh. 
And I go, oh, there's a delay on Zoom. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so true. Oh, my gosh. That's really funny. So today we're talking uh, about a new project that's coming to us from Familias, correct? Yeah. I love this publisher. I um, – yeah, I, um, you know, I, I do a lot of storytelling festivals. Um, the past couple of years, they've all been online. But, I, you know, I would perform all around. And one day, about 10 years ago, this guy came up to me. He's like, oh, your stories are great. I'm like, thanks. He's like, yeah, yeah, I want to publish them. Now, a lot of people say a lot of things. Like, yeah, 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 publish my stories. That's awesome. And then a couple of weeks later, I got a, a, you know, a deal from my agent from Familius. And at the time, you know, it's, it was a pretty, pretty small – it's still a pretty small publishing house for sure. But – they're like, we just love your stories. We do this. We do reading out loud for our kids. It was speaking to me as a dad. I was a young dad. I, mean, I, I had young children at the time. Not that they're not that old now. And it, it was the my first sort of I, I write picture books. That's how I got into publishing. And it was my first sort of chapter book, right? So the kids are like, oh, it's a chapter book. There's no pictures in it. You know, my, the kids that learned, you know, saw my early books when they were four or five are now, you know, older and they're reading this chapter book. It's very exciting. And then, you know, they moved they, – they do a lot of different things. I love how they, they help families. But they, they move uh, pretty well into picture books. And so um, the, the, the couple of the editors over there said, you know, I think your main story from your collection of stories would be a great picture book. And so, you know, as, as a writer is, you know, the, the story in the book, in the chapter book is, you know, 2,000 words. And that's too long for a picture book. So then it became how can I cut it down to 700 words – how do I change the story so it becomes a really good picture book? And then we worked on that all through the pandemic, actually. And we finally got to a version that was uh, willing to go to the illustrator. And then we waited, as, as you do, uh, for a long time for the illustrator to get the illustrations done. And finally, it's coming out in the spring of 2022. And so I'm super excited about it. You know, and it ties in with a lot of the things that I love to talk to kids about. My father comes from Cuba, and part of my own Cuban family tradition is all of the nicknames that we get from all of the different people that love us mm -hmm. and so um this book is just that how did i get my 11 nicknames i have well i have eight nicknames and my three real names and it it's a it's a really fun repetitious story that i really hope for sure makes kids laugh i mean that's my you you want to surprise and delight with your magic and your stories and i want to do the same thing with my stories but mainly i want the parents and the children to start investigating their own names. Mm -hmm. Why were they named? Why they are named? Were they named after anybody special in their family? Were they named after an amazing place or song even? And if you, you know, if you don't know, let's start asking. What about the grandparents? Why were they called what they were called? Uh, why were certain names changed? You know, and that's a lot of the people that came here. You can't pronounce their name. We're going to change the name. So it's a, it's, it's a super fun story that leads into, I hope, more discussion with families about just something so basic and so powerful is what is your name? Yeah. And so that's, uh, that's, that's what's coming out. I'm super excited about it. Yeah. That, that is neat. Having a name like Jed, uh, there's, there was also, there's actually, I think four or five different stories and they're all different from my mother, my mom, my dad, my grandmother, everybody had a different story of how I got the name Jed. I don't know. I like, this is a cool name. I was the only one growing up with the name. So that was very cool. So I didn't have to get the the nasty nickname in the neighborhood <laughs> that, that we all <laughs> that we get when we grow up in the city and on the exactly. east coast. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but I, I I love that idea of 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 talking of, of doing anything that that uh, ignites conversation between families, especially about family. I think that's so important. It is, you know, and I I mean I know. I think it goes without saying how much you love books and how much books are important and how we – I hope that all of the listeners have a, a house full of books and they have library cards and it's constantly important. And I, I love that. I think that we get intimidated or I get intimidated as a writer and as a dad when I read these books that are so amazing, these classics of children's literature, these beautiful picture books that are coming out now, and I don't feel like my own story is – can top – what I'm reading. So I'm like, you know what? Hey, kids, look, this is an amazing author. Just read this author. She's incredible. You got to check it. Oh, this one too. This one. Oh, here's a Carmen Didi, this amazing author from Cuba. I'm from Cuba, but I'm not as good a storyteller or a writer as she is. And I, I want parents to understand that there's nobody more amazing in your children's eyes than you. And we grow up with our own stories. We don't necessarily often think that they're 
as in, amazing or as important as these books. And, you know, I know I'm an author. I know how long we spend writing these books and we're putting our heart and souls in them. So anyway, the, the idea that, you know, put the book down and tell us, read a book about, I don't know, how a butterfly, whatever, and then put the book down and tell your kids a story about your discovery of butterflies when you were in sixth grade science class. Uh, you know, you're reading about, you know, some, whatever it is. I, I want kids to understand that the families have all these stories. And then, you know, even just sort of practically, I tell parents, I'm a storyteller and a children's book author because my, my people told me stories. <laughs> I'm just retelling the stories I heard and not even the stories I heard, the situations I had. One of my books is about a Christmas Eve meal at my grandmother's house in Cuba. And so I'm just telling the kids about how my grandmother celebrated Christmas Eve. How do your grandparents celebrate Thanksgiving or Kwanzaa or Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate? So, you know, I, this is the this is the thing that I, I think is really important. The last thing I'm going to say just to geek out about it is there's a, a whole mound of neuroscience that proves that every time you tell a story to a kid, you're helping that kid learn to read and write. Mm -hmm. They are developing an part of their brain, and I don't have the actual scientific um, vocabulary for it. There's a part of your brain that only is exercised by the oral tradition, by the telling of stories, by the sitting and listening, and then listening back to when your kid tells a story back to you. So, you know, part of my mission is to tell families, look, you are the most important literacy advocate for your kid, and you don't even need books, although I hope you have a million of them, you don't even need books to help your kids learn to read and write. Um, and, you know, and I think also the last, the, the, there's just a connection that happens when you're sharing a story with somebody. You know, we, in my family, we, my, my immediate family, we try to, you know, connect before we can uh, correct. This is what I learned from some parenting uh, advice column, right? So, you know, yell at your kid to eat his vegetables, but not before you've engaged with them and talked to them about their day. And now, hey, you know why your Uncle Henry is so strong? Because he eats his vegetables. Let me tell you about Uncle Henry when he was, you know, and so now it's a story instead of eat your vegetables, mm -hmm. right? So, I don't know. This is some of the things. I, it's funny. I'm I'm humbled to be a dad. Before I was a dad, I was much better at this stuff. <laughs> now I'm like, if you can get any food in your kid's mouth at night, awesome. Good for you. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's some of the thoughts. You know, you 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 bring up so many important points, and one of the things I want to touch on is that whole idea of of oral tradition. It's how we learned, how human beings learn for millennia. Before language was put into characters on a papyrus or carved into a wall, we, we told each other stories, and, and that's how we learned. And it's fascinating that now science, it, it, they're, they're, they're finding things that we kind of knew innately. And then we found this new technology of the, the page, and so we, oh, well, this is better. Let's throw away this other stuff. And I think that that's... Something that's going on now with our our kids and devices, it's like, oh, well, we don't need books anymore because we have videos and we have all this audios and podcasts. And, yeah, that stuff is cool, but it ain't going to be sitting down with mom or dad or grandma and sharing stories. It's so true. And it, it, it's interesting you bring that up because the the idea that we as parents – can't compete against technology, right? So back in the day, parents like, oh, no, how can I compete against this, you know, amazing printing of whatever story, the Shakespeare, you know, whatever, whatever those stories that were first printed, the ancient Greek, you know, stories. And now we're faced with how are we going to compete against these devices? You know, these, these are spectacular devices. You and I are speaking. We would never speak otherwise mm -hmm. in this way. And more people will listen to this than might see me at the local library telling stories. And that's amazing. Um, and so, you know, in a lot of ways, you look at what they're watching and what they're playing and you're like, I just don't, I can't, first of all, they're quiet, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I was raised in the seventies and we didn't even have seatbelts in the car. So we're just like raving <laughs> lunatics in the back of the car. And, you know, we had that station wagon, mom would have the back window down and we'd be breathing in the carbon monoxide and, you know, chucking our apple cores out the back of the window, trying to hit cars. And mom's trying to like running back with the hand, trying mm -hmm. to get us to sit down and, Everyone has the stories of the mom with the hand trying to stop us from going through the windshield in a big accident. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. this stuff is amazing, and it was dangerous. And if my mom had an iPad to throw at us so we would just shut up for two hours, oh, my gosh, she would have sold anything to do that. Mm -hmm. Or a plane, five hours on a plane. Yeah, it's miserable when a kid is screaming for five. 
here's an iPad, and they're going to be quiet. It's amazing. Also, they're exposed to things. I mean, my kids had to learn on devices, and they learn math and science on a device. So it's amazing. So I, 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 we all know that. And that part of your brain is turned off. You know, my wife and I love to watch a movie or a TV show on the weekends to turn off our brains. Our brains are too busy. Mm -hmm. Let's turn it off. You know, if you're a runner, you need to rest after a marathon. You can't run the next day after a marathon. You need, you need time to recover. We need this. We need the screen time at this point with the way society is going with how the stresses are. And you're missing out on muscle that has to be exercised and only you can exercise it. There's a, one of the studies I saw was um, the coma patients who are not responding to anything except there's a little brain activity that happens when they hear a loved member tell them a story. And so there let's, you know, as a parent, I'm thinking to myself, okay, who's more interesting, me or his iPad, his mm -hmm. iPad, what's better for his brain, me or his iPad? Well, he doesn't need any more screen time today. He needs his brain exercise. I'm going to tell him a story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you have a seventh grader like I do, you get a bunch of eye rolling and a bunch of moaning and a bunch of whatever. And then a couple of days later, you know, he's walking home with one of his friends and his friends was like, oh, your son told me that awesome story about when you got thrown out at second base at baseball. You know, and I'm like, I can't believe it. I didn't think he listened at all. And now he's at school telling a seventh grader about a story I told him instead of a time. You know what I mean? So like this is and, and again, there's a million times when I when I, I don't do what I'm what I'm telling other parents to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm try to come from that point. Like, you look, you're busy and you can you can say no screens in the car for the next five minutes and tell a story mm -hmm. as you're going to the beach about the beach. You can do that. Yeah. It's it's not telling you to do anything you're not already going to do anyway. You've right. got a captive audience. They are restrained in the back, you know. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find the fine line between, you know, encouraging parents and, and also letting them know, I know it's hard, you know, but it's it's important. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, if, if you can't think up of, of a story, remember a story right away, you can always just tell that story about being in the back of the station wagon when the tailgate opened up and your brother almost fell out and you're holding on to his – <laughs> All stories are true, and some of them actually happen. Absolutely, my da my daughter's in fourth grade, and she's she. I I, mean, I I preface everything. I say, "Hey, Nina, you know I lie for a living, right?" And she starts laughing. I said, "Well, let me tell you about when your uncle Henry and your brother, um, your uncle Robert, did this, you know." And you know, one of the things I do say, I I, I work with teachers a lot. This is the thing I love to do, and and mostly I'm, I want the teachers to know that they're storytellers, and they can when they're going from the rug to the math time or from recess to lunch or whatever they're doing, they can just tell their own stories to the kids as well. Now, many of us, you know, it's hard to remember way back when we were in first grade. I don't know the names of the kids in first grade. I don't remember the teacher's name, but I can remember kind of what it was like. So, hey, kids, when I was in first grade, my teacher said we had to go out and play kickball. And that, you know, and then it's, it's based on some memories, but just, I, you know, the characters of first grader, like the kids I might be teaching if I'm that teacher, and then the kids start to be engaged in a, in a way that's really, really interesting. You're creating a, a community where the kids want to be listening. You know, and then the, then the story becomes a becomes a, a treat. Hey, if everyone is quiet, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my crazy Uncle Pat, you mm -hmm. know. And then, then it's it becomes a, a classroom management tool that creates community and, and has the kids excited about what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I've, I've talked about here on the podcast, and I think this, this idea of storytelling would really help kids develop. Uh, my, my daughter and I, we've been on a lot of adventures together. She came out and toured with me uh, because of the way that she learned in high school. She was able to come out for three weeks at, at a time and travel around the country with me. And as you know, when you're traveling around the country, stuff happens. And, you know... She very quickly developed the skill that I developed, which was to when you're in the middle of these things that aren't pleasant and you don't know how they're going to turn out, we're able to turn to each other and say, this is going to make for a good story someday. And, and it's really helpful. And I think that if we're sharing these, these memories with our kids and telling our kids some of the crazy things that might have happened to us and, and the family members – then when they're faced with crazy things in their lives, they're going to be able to sit down and go, you know, my dad kind of like lived through crazy stuff and he survived and I figure I'm probably going to be able to get through it too. That is so interesting you say that. I think that, you know, one of the reasons the Grimm stories, the Brothers Grimm fairy tales have lasted for so long is it basically shows kids 
in grave jeopardy, and they often survive. Sometimes they don't, but they often do. And a kid reads that story and thinks, huh, if this character can survive that craziness, I can survive this thing that's happening. Because it's it's true. Every day, you know, everything. every day with my kids, watching my kids, something amazing happens at school and something kind of hard happens at school, you know. And I think you're right. The stories of your resilience, there's, you know, growth mindset is a, is a buzzword the last five or ten years that I've, I've been hearing. And it's true. You want, We want our kids to be able to handle what we don't even know is coming down the pike. You know, I think that in, there are many examples of how amazing we've all handled the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And nobody knew this was coming down the pike or that very, very few people did. So I think that's I think that's really I think that's really important. You know, in some ways, it's also just I, I love what you said that, you know, like all the crazy things that can happen. That's just the formula for a great story. Right. Mm-hmm. You need characters. It's me and my daughter on tour. You mm-hmm. need a place. We're in some crazy city. And then a problem happens. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's that's great fiction. Oh, how did you solve that problem? And then, you know, when I when I talk with kids, when I teach kids writing, you know, I say, you know, you're onto something when the character has changed in some way. Oh, so now the character realizes that you have to always carry an extra bottle of water so you don't die of thirst in Arizona or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a that's a really well, that's great that you were able to have your daughter on tour with you like that. That's incredible. But but you're right to turn it into a story, you know, when you're going through it to have that sort of uh, smart, you know, that this is going to be a good story. When it's not, oh, my gosh, this is the worst thing that could ever happen where this is a disaster. Oh, wait, we're going to tell a story one day about the time we got a flat on 95 and rush hour. This mm-hmm. is going to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And then the kids feel, oh, yeah, dad's got it. Mom's yeah. got it. We're yeah. OK. Yeah. This is going to be OK. Yeah. Because that that's. So important in life is to you know when you're facing the when you're facing the lion go uh, so what are we gonna do with this you know <laughs> I'm not gonna sit down and make myself an appetizer let's just figure out a way out of this it's so interesting my my, my son and I were just talking about this um he he referenced we we're reading some some actually news story and he's like oh that's like uh, Br'er Rabbit in the Briar Patch and so when you know these stories, when you have a knowledge of these of these old stories, it becomes something you can do, right? So, oh, am I going to am I going to trick the person that is chasing me or am I going to fight the person that's chasing me? Am I going to run away? What am I going to do? Am I going to use magic to get out of the mm-hmm. situation? Well, then what's magic in our lives? You know, I talk to the kids about that. Like, oh, magic doesn't exist. And I'm like, wait a minute. What is speaking another language? Oh, that's magic. You can speak to other people. What is drawing really well? Oh, that's magic. You can make something appear out of nothing. So I love that, you know, uh, my daughter, especially who's fourth grade, you know, finding the magic in the fairy tale, easy. That's a, ma- that's a giant. That's a flying girl. That's a, you know, a, a magic bean. And then I'm like, what's magic in your life? And asking that question, once she gets past the fairies and the, you know, the, the, the fly, she's like, huh. My friend is really magical. We can make something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. We can look at the leaves and tell stories about the leaves. And so, you know, I think that that's part of what we want, too. We want them to identify the wonder in the world Mm -hmm. and this this magic that is there. Yeah. Hey, and and, Antonio, how about the families that are listening to this? I know a lot of them might be sitting there going, oh, you know, but I have these stories, but they're, they're kind of boring. You know, nothing really... As a as a storyteller, we have this thing called creative license, right? We can yes. kind of polish yeah. our stories up a little bit. We do. So I, th- one of the things I like to ask is, you know, when I'm working with parents, I do a lot of parent workshops. I say, how many of you know somebody in your family that is that amazing storyteller, that amazing, you know, jokester, that amazing singer or whatever? Is, and a lot of them can identify, oh, yeah, yeah, that's my Tio Tito. That's my Aunt Clara. That's my, my Uncle Mike. And then I'll ask how, how many of you are the actual storytellers. So some of us have the gift. Mm-hmm. My, in my family, my dad, my dad always – I talk to him a couple times a week, and, and a couple times a month he says, Mijo, it's amazing you make a living as a storyteller because you're only the 10th best storyteller in our family. <laughs> so if you are like me, if you are only the 10th best storyteller in your family, you know, if the other nine aren't here, I'm all you got. That's right. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you about them. Let me tell you about my crazy Uncle Mike. He's so funny. This is how he taught me how to ride a bike. Let me tell you about Tio Tito. He was a boxer in Cuba. Let me tell you about him. So you don't have to be exciting. You just, you're, you're the only storyteller they got in that car. Mm-hmm. They're not going to have Jed there. They're not going to have me. I mean, theoretically with podcasts, whatever, but they're not, right? So it's, it's you. And, and also, 
you know, it's it's so interesting you say that because I do think we all think our – if we're not that number one storyteller in our family, we can easily identify that we're just not a good storyteller. It feels that I'm – you know, I'm as, as much of a joke, it's like, yeah, if only my Uncle Tom was a storyteller, he'd be amazing. Wow, but now – Uncle Tito passed away in 95. He's no longer around. I, I'm the only one that can keep his memory alive and his, his children too, for sure. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll have a, another little anecdote I wanted to share. I work with kids all the time, and there's some kids like, yeah, I got an amazing story. And, you know, they're five, they're six, they're seven, they're just learning to write. And a lot of times they're boring, but it's okay. They think they're amazing. That's great. But there was a girl who's like, yeah, I, I, everything's boring in my family. And I was like, oh, I don't think that's true, honey. I know a lot of, you know, you might feel that, but that's not. Tell me about your family. And she proceeded to tell me about her dad and her uncle and her mom and her brother. And, Jed, they all were kind of boring, actually. <laughs> there was not a whole lot going on. And I was like, oh, no, I met, I met the first, you know. And finally I said, well, is there anybody else? And she said, well, there is my grandmother. She lives with us. She's from Bulgaria, and she dances with her braid as she sings Bulgarian folk songs. Now, to me, this is a character that deserves her own picture book. But to the girl, it's just grandma. Mm-hmm. She sees her every day. Grandma's boring. And in my eyes, grandma is amazing. Oh, my gosh, please tell me more about her braid. How long is that braid? How does she dance with the braid? Can you show me how she dances with the braid? What are the songs? Oh, you can't sing Bulgarian? That's okay. Can you ask your grandmother to sing the songs and and record them? So, you know, we don't think our stories are valid if we are the 10th best storyteller in our family because we we live with them. Mm -hmm. And they're just our family. And then when you – if you have the courage to bring them out, other people are going to say – that's amazing. Yeah. I can't believe your family comes from Cuba and from Ireland. Yeah. You know, in Miami, there's a million Cuban families, but in all the other places I go, there's not. Tell me about Cuba. Where's Cuba? How do you celebrate? What is happening? What, you know what I mean? So I, I just, I want, I want parents to understand that they, they are the best storyteller in their family. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's those memories that they're creating that the kids are going to remember. Yeah. Truly, how many kids are going to remember that video game they played or that, you know, Switch or Xbox or that TV show they watched? How many times are they going to remember that time you told a story in the car or at dinner or you had some sort of monthly thing? Let's whatever, make some s'mores in the backyard in, in, a, in a little fire pit and, you know, talk about these things. Um, so I, you know, it's, 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 it's funny. It's, it's hard to be, you know, to see professionals like as, as you're reading and to think, ah, what can I add? And then I would just say, just try it, you mm-hmm. know, give it a shot. And if you're already doing it, great. Do more of it. Find other people. Find that if you do have the 10 best storytellers in your family, get them on a Zoom. Yeah. You know, have them, have your kid interview that kid. You know, what, you know, with all the technology, let's, let's record Uncle Tito in his nineties. I didn't really have a phone when he would, uh, you know, that to do that right. back then, and I wish I did. But yeah. you know, I got the next best thing in some ways. Yeah, that's um, amazing. I, even I, I'm just thinking back. There's this one uh, person uh, in our lives. He's the same age as my son, and he. We met him at a magic convention, and we retell the story. And, and he was maybe 12 or 13. My son was 12 or 13, and we relived the story of our first meeting him. He's now a dear friend. His mom is a dear friend. Uh, every time we get together, and and people love it, and it's just these little moments. And and I'm really happy that you came here to remind us that parents, as a parent, you are your child's first and most important teacher and storyteller. Yeah, I know you have a busy day today, Antonio. Remind everybody where they can go to find out more about you and all of the great stories that are coming from you. Well, my name is Antonio Sacre, and if you just go to my website, antoniosacre.com, there's lots of different things. But also, all of my recordings are on Spotify, and they're, you can download them free. I mean, you can stream them free on Bandcamp, and you can get, get all that information from my website. All of my books are in your public library. I love to give away all, all this. Just get my books from your public library. They're on Amazon. And then um, look out for my book coming out in the spring. It's called My Name is Cool. And awesome. it is a the picture book that's coming out from Familius, a, a wonderful publisher that I, I, I get to work with. Uh, we've had a great time speaking to our buddy, Antonio Sacre. Hey, Antonio, gracias. Nos vemos. <laughs> De nada, Jed. Thank you so much for having me. And I love what you're doing, helping families with um, all of the hard and wonderful things we get to do as parents. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Antonio about the power of family stories. Right now, we're going to take you to Lisbon in Portugal to speak with Moro and Mateo Moro. 
They're a father and son duo who are experiencing the joy of creating stories together. I am so excited. Our guests today are coming to us from Lisbon in Portugal. It's a father-son team. They are here to celebrate Fingerman Comics. Please welcome to the show Moro Moro and Mateo Moro. Hey, guys. How are you? We're great. Hi, Jack. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. That first voice was Mateo. Mateo, you are 10 years old, correct? Yes. Hey, before we ask your dad, tell us, who's the Fingerman? Fingerman is our imaginary friend that we invented when uh, we went on a trip, and I forgot my toys. Oh, so, you, so you're on a trip, you, you forget your toys, and I'm imagining, Maro, that that was like, oh, what am I going to do now? Exactly, I was desperate, and uh, <laughs> after a while, I have to come up with something, and so I start moving my two fingers as a little man, and and uh, Matteo locks it, and we start playing with it, and we call it Fingerman. Awesome, and how old were you at that time, Matteo? Three. Three years old. Okay, so Moro, I understand what a crisis that that was. Yes, that's correct. And the truth is that it was a, a sort of escamotage, right, to entertain uh, Matteo. But then he started really playing with it, and uh, this little figure, this little imaginary friend, start having a character and, and, and becoming very funny. So we start having plays with uh, Fingerman, we're having games with Fingerman, and later on we start writing down the stories of Fingerman. And, uh, and that was natural to come to the comics to visualize, right, the scenes, the storyboard of these adventures. That's how the comics of Fingerman started. Yeah, this is exciting. So uh, I'm, I'm understanding that uh, the evil man finger is the latest um, Fingerman adventure, Matteo? Yes. Can you tell us about the story? It's about Fingerman who creates... Uh, his um, alter ego, and but it uh, in, instead of just being in, inside of him, it's a real uh, character, and he's the, the complete opposite of Fingerman. So he just wants to eliminate him because he thinks that Fingerman is very annoying, a and uh, Fingerman has. Make it up has to defeat him before mm -hmm. um, he destroys his city. Wow, that is an intense story. Yes, you see, Manfinger uh, came up when Matteo was very interested about uh, uh, science. Mm -hmm. so still, he, 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 still Still he, he, he is. Um, the truth is that we were discussing about uh, science, and he came up with this uh, question and said, Papa, what is the antimatter? And I said, wow, Matteo, that's a very <laughs> sophisticated question. And, uh, and that uh, ignites me, right? uh, it triggered me, sorry, a sort of uh, uh, interest in uh, what is the antimatter and what is the alter ego. Because uh, Manfinger is not only the alter ego in terms of character, but it is also, it's the real opposite of Fingerman, because Fingerman is made by matter. Uh, uh, Manfinger is made of antimatter. And that's make the story even more interesting and intriguing. Yeah, and uh, and I, I I hear that if 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 matter and antimatter meet in person, like then the whole universe explodes and time comes to an end. Yes, they they need to defeat him and bring him to a lab where he can be controlled before his um, magnetic field uh, um, ends. I, I, who I I need to know the process of of. Coming up with this story, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, because my, my son is 29 right now, but we had these days where it's like, oh, I, you know, I would suggest one thing, and then my son would suggest something uh, more outrageous, and then it would just build and build. And build. Is, is that kind of what goes on between you two? Uh, that's correct. We work like a team, but I'm always uh, chasing my time. I'm always uh, uh, dropping questions. For example, okay, you want to use the antimatter, then how are we going to contain, right? How are we going to keep it? So he came up with an idea, and then I work on top of that idea. 
And so it's a sort of uh, like a ping pong, right? We are pulling, pushing like the, each the other. idea, and then it goes on the iPad to do a, a first sketch, and then we uh, put it in color, and we use it as a page. Okay, oh, this is already detailed, yeah, yeah. for the process. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that, that is how we work. We, we do a lot of sketches, we do a lot of storyboards, and we see if the uh, story, right, if the sequence has a, its own logic, as its own strength, I think it's, oh, sorry. Um, uh, and that's how we they, they, we started uh, building up the story. We are always trying to make a, a sort of sense of humor because the the input is to have a the laugh and learn, right? Mm. So uh, you we are we are always trying to uh, teach, teach, or at least. Uh, uh, transmit right a message of information of, uh, of about something, but very very nicely, very funny, very with with a lot of laughs, and, and that's also how Fingerman works because Fingerman is very naive, is very uh, uh, dumb. Dumb, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it, it has a, a very good chance, which is, is very lucky. Mm -hmm. So uh, cannot understand the thing, but he's very lucky, uh, and that's how he survived. So, uh, um, my finger is the exact opposite. My finger is the opposite. He's very smart, but really unlucky. Correct. Oh, so so there's two finger characters in the comic strip. True. Yeah. True. Okay. But two main characters. Two main characters. characters. Okay. So uh, how did how did uh, Dad's finger end up being the dumb lucky one? Um, because like. It was the game that we were playing that Fingerman was always being really stupid to, so, so that I would be entertained. So then he, it, it growed and, and um, because he kept everything uh, he was putting, like uh, we had this game on the escalator where he would have some magnetic boots and he would, and he would get stuck. Then he would get crushed, <laughs> but then he would come up the other side because he was dumb, but he was lucky mm -hmm. to survive. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. at the end, it's still a cartoon, right? In the cartoons, it's always a positive message. You, 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 I mean, Fingerman is full of explosion or, or, or stuff like this, but nobody gets hurt, mm -hmm. right? And nobody is uh, drastically eliminated from the scene. Uh, we just need to find a positive, uh, a positive way. Message. We need a message. In Italy, we said that uh, uh, fortune uh, favored the, the, the fools, right? And it's a bit this way. So uh, the, the good things of Fingerman is that he's brave. He's always uh, courageous. He always faces any kind of situation, even if he doesn't know nothing, <laughs> even if he has no idea what's going on. But he never gives up. Right, and this is the positive, positive message. And because of this, we want him to have this quality, which is is lucky. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fortunes for its fools. That's that's really neat, and it's really really fun. I, Mateo, what's it like? Um, you know, most kids who are ten are out playing baseball and and whatnot. But you're you're spending a lot of time with your dad creating this comic book series. Uh, what's that like? It's um, say um. Very uh, interesting process. M Matteo is very demanding. You know, <laughs> Matteo is very demanding. Uh, he came up <laughs> with idea, with solutions, uh, with uh, backup a lot of plans. Things, backup plans, plan B, plan C. The problem is that then you say, "Daddy, do it." <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, but it's very helpful, right? So he came up with the idea, suggestion, and story, but then I have to do all but the But you are good work. at drawing. But at the moment, yes, I'm good at drawing. I'm the illustrator, so... Well, I have a feeling, Matteo, um, you seem like a very bright young man. I expect that you'll be taking over the world I um, maybe when you're like 28, 29 years old. Uh, uh, what, what, what do you hope to be when you grow up? Someone. 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 <laughs> I haven't chose what my my future job yet. Okay, well that's that's very fair, but it's obvious that you're pretty busy right now, um, and and I like that you plan on being someone uh, at at some point when when you grow up. There are a lot of kids, I guess, who don't think they're going to be anybody. Um, to, tell us where we can go to learn more about the adventures of Fingerman. Our website. 
Tem até de, de é, www.fingermancomics.com Correct. We've had a wonderful time speaking to the father-son team behind the Fingerman comic series, Mauro Moro and Matteo Moro. Hey, my friends, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for having us. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. You're very kind. <laughs> very kind. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Raymond Arroyo. He'll be here to celebrate the spider that saved Christmas. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to thank our guest, Antonio Sacre. Be sure to check out his website. also want to thank Moro and Mateo Moro. Be sure to check out Fingerman Comics. I want to thank our sponsors, Becky Cummings, The Magic of Me Series. And also want to thank the folks over at Once Upon a Dance. Please be sure to check out their creative movement series. I want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan, Rory Brady. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.